out of the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, one minister said a number of years ago that no one has a choice of whether or not they live by words. But he has the choice of what words he lives by. Our words have power and our words have authority. See, we are spirit beings. Amen? We, have, we are spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. Your body, like I said, it's your body is your earth suit. You know, you can't function in this natural realm without a physical body, but you do exist without the body. When people die, uh, really that's just simply the, 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 uh, the body and the spirit become separated, but the spirit of man does not cease to exist. Um, you know, we, we're so... Um, driven by what we see what we, by, by, the, by the, the senses that if we can't see somebody talking or moving, we think they, they don't exist anymore. But in, in actuality, that's just the body, the house that they have to function in the natural realm. God is a spirit. Amen? Those that are, that are asleep in the Lord, their bodies are, have gone to the ground and, and returned ashes to ashes and dust to dust. But their spirit, if you're born again, you go to be with the Lord. Paul said to depart, with, uh, to, to, to be, depart and be with Christ is far better. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. So, you know, the real man is the spirit man. You possess a soul. That's your will, your intellect, your emotions. Uh, unsaved people um, go into Gain. Well, I can't even pronounce it. Just hell. All right. Hallelujah. Uh, so it's good to be saved. Everybody say it's good to be saved. Hallelujah. But regardless, you know, whether you live by your words, your words have authority. God spoke the universe into existence. He said, light be light was. Now, see, I, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. And some of you go, well, that's, that's evolution. No. God, was, God went, light be like was. The Big Bang. And actually, science has proven that the universe is expanding in every direction at the speed of light. Why? Because the first thing God said was light be. And he never told it to stop. It's still obeying God. The universe is still acting in obedience to the statement God made, light be. That's awesome. It's still expanding at the speed of light in every direction. Isn't that cool? See? See? Well, science knows this. Let me tell you something. When science thought the world was flat, the Bible said it was round. Did you know that? The Bible says that God wrote on the circumference of the earth. How many know what a circumference is? It's what? Our circumference. I, I'm Eastern Carolina. We say stuff the way we want to say it. <laughs> it's round. God was riding on the round earth when the scientists said, if you fly, go, go out there too far, you'll fall off. God knows, what he's, God knows before anybody else knows. Amen? All right. So let's go here. Uh, words are what we live by. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. We'll look at verses 36 and 37. Jesus talking here. Matthew 12, 36. We could really back up to verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Now what we say, garbage in, garbage out. What you put in is what comes out. You do not get something different than what you put in. Now being a computer, computer programmer by trade, um, way back before I was in the ministry, um, you could write the coolest program in the world, but if they put the wrong data in, you didn't get the right answer out. It would, skew, it would skew the results if the wrong data went in. So it doesn't matter how good you're... And actually, the program worked exactly the way it was designed to work. It took the data, processed it, and gave the results accurately according to what was put in. But what was, if what was put in was wrong, you got the wrong thing out. It doesn't matter how great the, pro the program didn't have artificial intelligence. We could go, hey, this is wrong. You know? And so, you know, the evil man, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart, the evil man out of the evil treasure, the treasure gets in there by what you put in, by what you meditate on, by what you feed on, by what you think about. You can't sit around and listen to what the world says about everything and think you're going to get godly results. We turn on, we turn on afternoon television and listen to the, you know, the uh, television psychologist tell us about, about life and about how things are supposed to be. And then we, we formulate an opinion or an idea, and then when we get done, we got messed up answers, and the Bible's totally opposite. And they, well, the Bible's out of date. Man, the Bible's very, real relevant. The Bible's still relevant. It will always be relevant. Why? Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Okay? The Bible is the most relevant book you'll ever have. Now, people are trying to undo it. Why? Because if they can undo the Bible, you take away all moral authority, you take away a baseline of anything, how many know if you do any kind of scientific experience, you've got to formulate what first? 
You've got to have the baseline that's formed out of everything so that when you operate, you're operating from some, some standard. You can't have a variable standard. If you have a variable standard, you'll never get accurate results. So this will be all over the place. Okay? If you're doing statistics, you've got to, have, you've got to have something to measure off of. You know, global warming, the global climate, you know, the global climate change bunch is making all their analysis on based on the information from the past 30, 40, maybe 50 years, some climatological data from, the, you know, the late 1800s. But you've got to understand, those were stations, you know, that were recorded maybe 120 years ago. One little station here. We are now measuring the world temperature by satellite. And it's kind of hard to put those two together and say that they're accurate representations against each other. So you create weird baselines. You know, how many know, how many remember this one? 20 years ago, they said that if we didn't stop the greenhouse gases, the planet was going to heat up, the polar ice caps were going to melt. And then about, about five years ago, they came out and said, that it was, said that it didn't happen, it's not happening, the planet's not heating up, the things aren't melting. Well, the global, the, the, the greenhouse gases are blocking the sun's rays. Now, it was the, the gases were going to cause it to heat up. Now they're blocking the sun's rays and causing global cooling. Well, good, let's put more up there because we don't want to heat up and melt. See, if you don't have an accurate baseline to work from, you're not going to get accurate results. Now, same thing's true in the Word of God. You've got to have the accurate baseline of what the Word says in your life to create uh, something to measure from and to base from and to walk from and to live from. In other words, God's, war, God's Word, God's law has to, be God's, has to be the final authority of your life by which you live by. And that is where you get the right words from. You have to begin to agree with what God says, not, but what, not what you feel or how it looks. You know, we cannot be driven by our senses. We have to be driven by our faith in what God said. All right. Jesus says, it goes on verse 36 and says, I say to you that every idle word, useless or lazy word in the Greek, um, that men shall speak, they should give an account of thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. In other words, you set blessing or cursing into your life by what you say. Now, under, now we're going to take a premise here. We're going to establish a premise. We're presuming we're talking to Christians who are born again by the Spirit of God, they're children of God, and that the Word of God is now your baseline. You will have blessing, and really the world works this way too, but you, you can't walk in the blessings of God if you're not born again. So we're not just talking about mind over matter, the power of positive thinking, Okay, we're talking about people who are speaking out of the recreated, out of the spirit, out of the spirit, what they either have or what they want. Let me tell you, say something. If you keep saying what you got, that's what you're going to keep. You keep saying what you got, you're going. That's what you're going to keep. You cannot change your future until you change what you say. Proverbs six two says, "Thou art snared by the words of thy mouth; thou art taken by the words of thy mouth." Proverbs twenty one twenty three: Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. All right. Let's go on down to Proverbs 18. This is a good one. 18 verses 20 through 21. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love us shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, we've used that scripture time and time again, but the today's English version it has a very good translation. of it. Excellent translation of this it says you have you will have to live with the consequences proverbs 18 20 and 21 you will have to live with the consequences of everything you say you well i mean say what you say can preserve life or destroy it so you must accept the consequences of your words the words you speak have consequences you speak death and destruction you're going to get death and destruction you speak life and blessing you'll get life and blessing well, where do we speak life and blessing? Well, you say what God's Word says. Do you know the word confess? Uh, we, we talk about confession a lot. The, conf the word confess in the, uh, means to, to say the same thing as. To speak the same thing. Same thing as what? It's what God says. When we confess His Word, we're speaking what God says. Amen. Amen. Now, how many of you ever gone, you know, man, I'm, I'm so sick I could die. But the Bible says by His stripes you were healed. Amen. Now, you keep speaking, I'm so sick I could die, and guess what you're going to be doing? Looking down from heaven at Pastor Ed doing your funeral. See, you need to say what the Bible says. By whose stripes ye were healed. 1 Peter 2.24. Whose own self bear our sins in his body on the tree that we being dead to sin shall live unto righteousness. By whose stripes ye were healed. 
And somebody will come along and go, that's talking about spiritual sickness of sin. That's not what Matthew, I mean, Mark, I mean Isaiah 53, uh, verses 5 and 6 say. It's not what Matthew 8, 16 and 17 say. And Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew 8, 16 and 17 says, Then when the evening come, he, he, they brought all of them that were sick and possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits and healed the sick with his word, that it might be fulfilled without what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Then 1 Peter 2.24 quotes that in fulfillment as a fulfilled prophecy saying, by his stripes ye were healed. You can't take the Bible and read the Bible and come out with it being spiritual. Sin is spiritual. Sickness is physical. If you are physically sick, there is a cure for you. But you're going to have to say what God's word says about it. I said, you're going to have to say what God's word says about it. You're going to have to put in your mouth what the Bible says about your circumstance or your situation. Hello. We, we, we are so negative in society. Think of our, our, of our catchphrases. Everything, you know, that tickled me to death. Oh, I laughed so hard I thought I'd die. Yeah, that just kills me. That's good. How negative is our language? But the Bible's full of positive language. You're blessed coming in and blessed going out. You're the head, not the tail, above only, not beneath. Glory to God. You'll be blessed when you rise up, blessed when you lie down. Are you here? According to that, if you keep his word. But the Bible's full of positive language. Amen. Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've been made more than conquerors through him that loved us. Glory to God. What can separate us from the love of God? This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Full of faith, full of life, full of blessing. But the world's full of death. We celebrate walking zombies for crying out loud. People want to watch the walk of death. And you can't kill the dead. Is there a way to kill them? You might know. Cut their heads off or something? Cut their heads off. Ben? Anything, anything where the head's removed? Or burn them? So there's three ways to kill the walking zombies. You know, we, we celebrate now. Now the, the big thing is vampires. You got vampires and werewolves. You know, six movie series on were werewolves and vampires. You know, we're celebrating death. You know? Can't kill the vampire, you know, except get him in sunlight, except if he gets, now they got new drugs that keep him alive in the sun. I don't know. Some of y'all remember the, the, the soap opera from the 60s and 70s, Dark Shadows with Barnabas, the vampire. You know, you, and Barnabas couldn't be killed. You know, they, they figured out a way to keep him alive during the daylight. You know, we celebrate our, our language is a language of death in the world. Because the world lives in the fear of death. But the believer, Dad Hagen used to say this. He would say, you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. How do you get ready to die? You get saved. Amen. Then you're ready to die so you can live. Amen. You don't have to be afraid of death. Paul wrote and said, oh, grave, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Amen. So we, we need to understand that our words have authority and power, and we need to be speaking the life that God's word has instead of the death that the world's offering unto us. We need to speak things full of life. So you'll live with the consequences of everything you say. A number of years ago, a man was in a car wreck with his family, and, and, and he was thrown out, and the family's there, and the, uh, the rescue squads and the rescue crews were there working on his family, and they looked like they were about dead. He's up walking around. But they, they, everybody, everybody at the scene heard him walk around saying this, my God, I'm a dead man. My God, I'm a dead man. My God, I'm a dead man. Every one of his family lived, and he died. Why? He's called it into existence. Elvis, how I many remember Elvis? Elvis is not alive. If you, saw, if you saw Elvis, it was an impersonator, and there's plenty of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he said uh, all the time. Uh, you know, Elvis would say, I'll never live to past the age of my mother. He died the same age as his mother died. And J.D. Sumner, the J.D. Sumner and the Stamps, which was the back, the, you know, they had a gospel group say back up with him. J.D. Sumner and the Stamps, a gospel quartet. And he said, if he said it once, he said it a thousand times. He heard him say it over and over again. But he would never live past the age of his mother. He died the same age his mother died. Why? He called it. He spoke it. He declared it. He called it into existence. Your words have authority. And I'm not going to tell you, if you want a future, you've got to speak a good future. If you want blessings, you've got to speak blessing. If you want more than enough, you've got to speak more than enough. Are you here? You go home. All right. James says, um, well, I'm sorry, Proverbs 18, 7, back up seven verses of that same chapter, says, a fool's mouth is his destruction, 
and his lips are a snare of his soul. Man, let's not be foolish. Let's be smart. Let's be wise Christians. Amen? Hallelujah. James 1.26 says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridle not his tongue. Hello? But deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Think about the fact that your mouth can be cause you to be deceived. Deceived to the point you believe what the world and the circumstances say versus what the Word of God says. Now, the Bible has a lot of things to say about you. I said the Word of God has a lot of things to say about you. One place it says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Amen? Glory to God. That you should show forth the praises of him that brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. A holy nation. I'm sorry, I have to look at that third thing. A holy nation. How many ever felt like a royal priesthood? How many feel like, you know, you're the peons of the priesthood? One verse says he's made his king. Now, King James says this. Made us kings and priests unto our God. The literal Greek says he's made us a kingdom of priests unto our God. But you don't get up in the morning. Most people don't get up in the morning going, I'm, a, I'm part of the kingdom of priests. You might be getting up and going, my God, Jesus, are you anywhere around? He said he'll never leave you or forsake you. We ask if he's even around. Yeah, start, start singing, Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Come by here, my Lord. Come by here. He said he'd never leave you or forsake you. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. See, we've got to see what the Bible says about things. It, God always causes us to triumph through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why do we keep talking like we're going under? Because you've chosen to accept your information and deposits into your heart from the wrong place. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, casting down imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Amen. Isn't that what he said? Why did he say that? Because those thoughts will drop into your heart. And then out of that treasure of your heart, whether good or evil, you'll bring it forth and you'll start speaking it. And what you speak, you're going to have to live by the consequences of the words you declare. We just read that out of the 20th English, 20th, uh, the, uh, the ta today's English version. Amen? Well, can y'all say something? Amen? Hallelujah. I'm looking for verse 17. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. He says, For we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Let me say something, folks. If you're trying to win your battles with carnal means, you're going to lose. Satan will destroy you. Satan will be your master in that arena. But see, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So stop trying to do it in the flesh and get into the spirit. Glory to God. Can you say amen? They're not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. What's exalting itself against the knowledge of God? You're not going to make it. You're not good enough. You don't have the ability. Really? You can't do this. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. See, the world speaks, and the negative thoughts to the enemy come and say, you can't do this, but God's already given a declaration. You can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. <coughs> Christ, the anointed one in his anointing. What's he anointing with? Well, according to the book of Isaiah, the anointing is the yoke-destroying, burden-removing power of God. You can overcome. We're, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I'll never make it. I'll never win. I won't get over the top. Man, you, stop, you need to stop being like that little train saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And you start being a Holy Ghost train saying, I know I can, I know I can, I know I can. Thank you, Jeff. We now have surround sound. <laughs> Jeff gave in the chugga-chugga sound effect. Hallelujah. Now, if, if we're going to speak, remember, we, 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 we live by the words we speak. We suffer the consequences or relish in the consequences of the things we speak. And if you don't like what you're suffering in, change what you're saying. Amen. Put on a different mouth. 
How am I going to put on a different mouth? By putting in different stuff in the inside of you. Start saying I can't make it. Start saying that I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Start saying that I overcome in every circumstance of life through Jesus Christ my Lord. Start saying that I got victory because the faith of God that's in me causes me to overcome. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen. I'm an overcomer. When they show that ABC sports Wild World of Sports film clip. Remember that old one where the guy broke his leg coming off the, uh, off, yeah, you know, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat? We don't know the agony of defeat. We only know the thrill of victory and the thrill of victory and the thrill of victory. Glory to God. Because we're conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. Glory to God. We need to be saying what the Bible says and stop saying what we see and what we feel. Amen. Satan is, t is deceiving you. Casting down imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to shorten this. Hallelujah. Go to Numbers, the 13th chapter. Y'all all know about this story. You should, I mean, you should at least learn this in Bible school, Sunday school. Numbers 13. They're about to cross over into... Canaan land, and, they, and God says, to, you know, choose somebody from each tribe and send them into the land to spy out the land. So Joshua gets them all together. He make, remember, Moses can't go in. How many know why Moses couldn't go into the promised land? Because he struck the rock twice. See? God gave him the water, but see, you, see he, had, he could not let Moses go in because the symbolism of striking the rock was the rock was Christ, and he was only struck once. He never was to be struck again. His, his sacrifice was enough one time. That's why Moses couldn't go in. It had to be the allegory. It had to be the lesson that they learned that when God struck Christ for our sin and laid on him the sin of us all and the sickness of us all, he was only struck once, whereas Moses struck the rock twice. And had Moses been allowed to go in, people would have misinterpreted that and began to say, you gotta get, you, Christ has to die over and over again. But he only had to die once to obtain an eternal redemption for us. That's why, he, that's why he couldn't go in. Well, that's a little harsh. No, nope. you know you got pinheads out here right now who'd be teaching that if he got gone in. They'd be teaching stuff that's not biblical. And they already are, that's right. Even, when, even though God showed up and said no. All right, so they're about to go over. Moses, Moses didn't get to go over. Joshua's about to take him in. Sins in the spies. Okay. Hallelujah. I'm a little ahead of myself. I am way ahead of myself. That other thing is when they get ready to actually go in. They show up, they're supposed to go in this time. I'm sorry, I, I got way ahead of myself. Moses doesn't go in, but he doesn't go in. For, this is 40 years later when Moses gets. This is right now the first time. I'm sorry. Excuse me for getting ahead of myself by about five chapters. They show up to go in, send in the spies. Then the spies come back, they bring up a report. All right? So let's look here in uh, verse 26. Verse 25. And they came, they returned to land. From search of land after 40 days. I'm, uh, the, have y'all got the story straight? I'm, I got the story straight. Have y'all got it straight? This isn't where Moses doesn't get to go in yet. Moses is about to go in, but he doesn't get to go in. Later. 40 years later. They went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel into the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh and brought back word unto them and showed them all the congregation, the fruit of the land, and told them, We came unto the land where thou sinnest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. Remember, God told them he would bring them to a land that floweth with milk and honey. Folks, the Bible teaches us that the Old Testament scriptures are written and the things particularly pertaining to Israel and their wanderings and their dealings with God were written as examples to us. God told them that when he delivered them, he was going to bring them into a land that floweth with milk and honey. Can I tell you something? God knew there were giants there. Hello? You may have got a promise from God and show up and run into a giant. God didn't get caught off guard. God wasn't surprised. God didn't go, oh man, I didn't know that. Hello? I mean, God didn't go, hey, Jesus, come here, we've got to have a conference with the Holy Ghost. Did you guys know that there were giants over there? God wasn't caught off guard. 
He just didn't give them all the information. Why? If he had told them up front there were giants there, they would have booked. Amen. Hello? Clunk went the cow. Okay. Hey, yeah, if God told you everything you were going to encounter, most Christians, in your walk of overcoming and winning by faith and defeating the enemy, you'd quit. Say, take me home right now. That's what it's called. We walk by faith and not by sight. So he said, I'm bringing you to a land that flows with milk and honey. They come back. Hey, man, it's just like he said. It flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Remember, they brought out a cluster of grapes on a staff. Now, I want you all to go to Food Line or Lowe's or Harris Teeter this afternoon and sit outside in your car. And I want you to watch for a couple hours. And I want you to see if anybody walks out, two men walk out with a cluster of grapes on a staff. Now some 98-year-old grandma is walking out with a little bag of them. <coughs> Why? This land was so fertile and so productive that everything grew like super grow. It had miracle grow before miracle grow was on your grocery store shelf. Hello? Why? Because it was a land that, that, that flowed with milk and honey. It was the land God had promised his people. And it was blessed. And so here they go. Hey, just like he said, it flows with milk and honey. Here's the grace. Look at this. This is awesome. Then three, then a three, three words put together, creating the word nevertheless. That is old-fashioned, long way of saying, but. Hello. The people be strong in the land. God didn't know there were strong people there. And the cities are walled. Ooh. That just, that, that's, that God's out of the picture now. They've got walled cities. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak. That's giants. There. The Amalekites dwell in the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea. And the houses have the termites. Oh, no, that's not in there, is it? Okay. By the coast of Jordan. Now here they start coming up with all the problems of the land. God did not say, go check it out and find out what you can't deal with. It's what he told them it was. It was a land that flowed with milk and honey. Do you not think God already had a contingency plan for the people in the land? Do you think that what you came up against when you were starting to follow after God, this is you need to get, we need to get back to understanding. God's brought you to a certain place, and you've run into a hard place. Don't you know that God had a contingency plan to deal with what you ran up against? Amen. Amen. He knows everything. He didn't bring you there to cause you to fail. Just like later on when the children of Israel say, would to God, we were back in Egypt. He brought us in this wilderness to kill us. He didn't bring them in the wilderness to kill them. As a matter of fact, if they kept the mouth shut, they wouldn't have been in the wilderness in the first place. Right. The only reason they went into the wilderness is because they, 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 uh, they needed lockjaw. They didn't have lockjaw. We'll find out what happens here. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. See, that's, somebody got some faith. Let us go up at once. And possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Why? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Come on now. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. But the men that went up with him, remember the bunch that said, nevertheless? You can't go by what the crowd says. Now we find out from here that ten of the spies were the nevertheless bunch. Caleb and Joshua were the let us go up at once bunch. They were outnumbered five to one. And when you start walking by faith, you're going to find out you're going to be outnumbered a lot of time by the naysayers. The naysayers have a negative report. Even when you start speaking the Bible. We're well able to go out and possess it. If our God is for us, who can be against us? But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. Wait a second. You mean the God 
that delivered you with the, with the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the frogs and the lice and the hail falling from heaven and the firstborn dying and the rivers turning to blood, the God that brought you out with a strong arm, I, I mean, I'm, are you here? The God that drowned the entire Egyptian army, hallelujah, in the, in the depths of the sea, and they started singing, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into, thrown into the sea. And now you run up, and you got some strong people on the other side, and you're going to start whining. See, Caleb and Joshua understood that if God be for us, who can be against us? And when they faced that battle and they saw those men, they said they might be stronger than us, but our God's bigger. And so us and God are the majority. Glory to God. we got to get back to where God and us are the majority. And your brothers and sisters in Christ might be weenies. They might be faith weenies. But you can be strong in faith. We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Listen to verse 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they searched unto the children of Israel. The land we walked through, which you've gone to search, is a land that, listen to this. Now, how do they know this? They didn't see people getting eaten up. So you start down the path of negative confession and negative believing and negative thinking, and then you start envisioning all kinds of stuff. Now, I remember growing up, uh, my brother lived two houses down from us. He, he bought a house. There was one, two, there was two houses in between us and then his house. And every night, look out the window. Where's Frank? He's in a ditch somewhere, upside down, drowning, and nobody knows it because we didn't have cell phones back then. Didn't have bag phones, didn't have car phones. We didn't have any kind of phone. Might have a ham ready, breaker, breaker, good buddy. What's up? What's your handle? Y'all remember those days? Who don't remember those days? Who's not going, oh, yeah, girls, they, thank you for being honest. There's other people here, they just want to admit it. Okay, Cal. Yeah. I mean, after Smokey and the Bandit, everybody had a ham radio or a CB radio. A CB radio. What's your handle, good buddy? And he'd ride down the road talking, breaker, breaker, one nine. You know, Smokey the Bandit's out there. I mean, that was the cop because, man, a lot of state troopers had those Smokey the Bear hats. So they called him Smokey. Every night. I hear, for, I, hear, hear, I hear two things. The stove being hit to make sure all the burners went on, even though they were turned off. They were going to burn the house down there in the middle of the night. Or my brother was upside down in a ditch somewhere drowning. That's fear. That's worry. And you see, when you begin to lay hold of those things, it just runs and builds a scenario of unbelief and destruction and misery and all this kind of stuff. You've got to lay hold of your thoughts and bring them into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Are y'all here? You gone home? And here's what happens: they went in, saw the big people, saw the wall cities. They come back and bring back this evil report, and then they say this: the land which we went through, we have searched, it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that were that we saw in it are men of great stature. We saw the giants, the son of Anak, and were come of the giants. Listen, this, listen, to this next statement. Are you ready? Underline this in your Bible. Star it. We were in our own and, and, and some. And all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. And we saw the sons of Anak, which come to the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Now, if you'll study this out a little bit more and do some more study, you'll find out that one of the questions they finally asked him in one of the events, you know, then people getting defeated is, what took you all so long? They lived in that land in fear of the God of Israel showing up with his people and running them off. And they show up and see the big guys and they get scared. The Israelites get scared of the big guys and they've been living in fear of Israel showing up. Why? Because they heard about their God. Whatever you're dealing with in life, whatever you're facing in life, your God's bigger. You have your role to play. Step out in faith. He'll be right there with you. Remember, the Holy Spirit takes hold together with us against our infirmities. Yeah. Romans 8th chapter, he says, help, he helpeth our infirmities. Helpeth in the Greek means takes hold together with against our weaknesses. The Holy Spirit helps you. He's your helper, not your doer. Yeah. You step out in faith, he'll dare to back you up. He's got your six. Amen. 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 God, the, the Old Testament says he's our re-reward, which basically means in military terms, he's got your six. He's got your backside. Amen. Don't turn your backside to the enemy. Now, 
the good thing is the enemy can never outflank you because you've got the Holy Ghost taking care of you. Go straight into the battle. Go straight in, knowing that God will deliver you and God will bring you out. But notice here that the enemy only saw them as, uh, as grasshoppers and when they saw themselves as grasshoppers. Hello. Do you know if you project... I, I remember... Um, I'm going to tell my story from, from uh, middle school. Y'all have heard this before. Wade Wilson. Wade was a bully. Now, Wade had been held back twice. So when we were in the sixth grade, he was supposed to be in the eighth grade, but he's still in the sixth grade. So when we got to the eighth grade, he's supposed to be a sophomore in high school. He's still in eighth grade. And so he was, the, he was the class bully. Because back when we were in the fifth and sixth grade, he was a lot bigger than us because he was two years ahead of us. But see, something usually happens to people in that fifth to eighth grade, ninth grade range. They get bigger. Well, when I was smaller, Wade would pick on me. He would tell me what to do, I would do. I mean, whatever he told me to do, I just did it. Because Wade was, yeah, he was bigger. And you, you get to the eighth grade, and you still think you're the same size as you were in the fifth. And don't realize you've grown, and he has it. I mean, that's just, that's how it is. And that's how the devil works. Do you know the Bible says something very interesting? When we sit in heaven and watch him cast into the pit, the Bible says we will, we will ask this question. Is this he who calls the nations to tremble? He's like a little wizard of Oz with his big machine trying to scare everybody. And so Wade, one day at school, Wade came up to me and he, you know, and went back in my day, you know, I mean, the, the mean thing to do was take a rubber band with a paper clip on it make, and then and, and, and just pull it back and, and whack you with it. So he, he came and says, turn around. <laughs> and you know, you, you, you got, you're going to have to get fed up with being bullied by the devil. I said, I'm not going to do it. He said, turn around. I'm not, you've got you to draw a line in the sand with the devil. You've got to make a stand in your faith. You've got to make a stand with the word of God. He said, after school, right after school, meet me. I'm going I'm to take care of this. All right. I, was, man, I just I sat there all day thinking. But the, the more I sat there, the matter I got. I've been, put, I've been putting up with this for three years, and I'm tired of it. I've had it. You know, and I tell you, you've got to build yourself up in faith so that when the devil shows up, you're just ready to knock his block off. You're a rock, a sock, and robot. Remember those? Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. Boom! Clink. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, that was high-tech gaming back then, buddy. And so I, I went outside, and our school was a two-story school with steps, no elevator. We didn't have escalators or elevators in our school. We didn't have all kinds of laws that you had to do that just because somebody, you know, one person might not be able to make it up. You know, people, people, you know, toughen up. Walk up a pair of steps. If you can't get up, we'll get you up there. Pick up and carry you up. Get tough. Toughen up. Everybody get tough. Amen? We got to be tougher. We, we have got to stop being wimpy yeah. in life. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm outside the school. I get, I get there early. I'm ready. And here he comes. He walks down the steps, and I drop my books, throw my cut off, and I start running. I got my fist caught. I'm going to KO him. And he starts going, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop, stop, stop. Then I realized, oh, he's scared of me. I said, don't you ever, ever hit me again. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still cocked. I mean, if he, if he flinches the wrong way, I'm going to KO him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pound him out. He never bothered me again. I got bigger. I gained another 40 pounds. He never got any bigger. Okay? Now, he told people he, he beat me up and stuffed me in the locker room, but that, he told people that. And he never told me that. Playing football, you know, I did stupid. I, I was stupid. I beat lockers in on my head, beat, beat center block walls in my head to intimidate people. I was just, I, got, I was crazy. All right? I mean, seriously, I walk up to a center block wall, and they, they start talking trash to me. I just go, hoo Thank God God delivered me. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. Beat doors in my head. I do all kinds of stupid stuff. Anyway, the fact was, he was more afraid of me than I was of him. But as long as he convinced me, he was bigger. As long as he convinced me, he was stronger. As long as he convinced me he had the upper hand, I was at his beckoning will. And the devil does the same thing. He tries to tell you that he's great. He tries to tell you that he's mighty. He tries to tell you. The Bible says he walks back as a roaring lion. He didn't say he was a roaring lion. Why? Because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
Satan, Satan's just like a gummy bear. He's an old detoothed lion. He can gum you. That was supposed to be a humorous point. Thank you, Jeff. Satan walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. How can he, what does he do? He has to convince you that he's more powerful. But Jesus, the greater one, says we're more than conquerors to him that loved you. So let me ask you a question. What are you facing today? Then you need to go find scripture that covers what you're dealing with and speak the word over it and act on the word and get into faith about the fact that God is greater than your circumstance. God is bigger than what you're dealing with. God is more powerful than the enemy. Glory to God. Amen. When, they brought, when the children of Israel came out, he brought them out with a strong arm. When they got out there and came up against the children of Enoch, and listen to this, verse, chapter 14, verse 1, and the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept all night. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. Listen, they just, listen, when they brought them out and they drowned the Egyptians in the sea, they're singing songs and praising them, dancing and shouting. Run up against a hard place, now they're going to murmur against the leaders. They should have murmured against the ten who brought up the evil report. And the whole congregation said, and then would God, we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God, listen to this, we died in this wilderness. What happens to everybody above 20 years old? They died in that wilderness. They pronounced their own judgment out of their own mouth. Because they didn't, they received the wrong report. We got a song we sing in the church, Whose Report Will You Believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. His report is I am free. Amen? And that goes on and on and on. Listen, we need to get back to speaking the report of the Lord. And if you'll do that, you'll have victory. You'll live, a over, live an overcoming life. You'll live in a land of abundance and full supply. I'm not going to say you're not going to face giants. You're not going to face walled cities. You're not going to run into trouble. But I am telling you, when you get there, God's not surprised. He's already got the answer. As a matter of fact, the book, the, 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 there's a scripture in the New Testament that says this. He knows what we have need of before we ask. What's that mean? He's never surprised by what you run into. He's already got a way out before you get there. I said he's already got a way out. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the service. Thank you that Jesus is our Lord. Thank you that you direct us into the land of blessing, land of full supply, overcoming, and victory through the words that we speak. And you give us the very words to speak. You said our ways are not your ways and our thoughts are not your thoughts. And that your word is to be in our mouth. If we put your word in our mouth and speak the word, it will produce what you said it would produce in our life in Jesus' name. If you're in an attitude of prayer, heads bowed, eyes closed. I want to give you this opportunity this morning. If you're not born again, now, again, you know, the new birth is, is coming unto the Lord Jesus Christ, accepting the lordship of Jesus. Paul wrote to the church and said, if you believe that, God, that Jesus is the son of God, God raised him from the dead. Amen? And confess him as Lord. If you believe that he's the son of God, but confess him from the dead, and that you confess him as Lord, you'll be saved. We're not asking, you don't have to come up here and recant every sin you ever committed in your life. It's simply accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord. Confession of sin comes after you, but when you're a believer, if you mess up afterwards, you just confess that sin. The new birth is acknowledgement that you're lost without God. You believe that God is, Jesus is God's son. He raised him from the dead, and you declare his lordship over your life. You come into the family of God. You're born of, born of the spirit of God. If you're here this morning, you're not born again, would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. I'll lead you in a prayer that bring you into the family of God. You can know, the, you can know this life of victory. You can know the ways of God and the ways of the Spirit. Another offer I have for you, if you're backslidden, that, we, that's not real hard to figure out. You were going forward, you went backwards. You were walking with God, you went the wrong way, you went backwards. If you're here this morning, you're backslidden, you want to get right with God, raise your hand, I'll pray with you. All right, thank you, I see that hand. All right. Anyone else? God is a good God. God's a merciful God. Amen. God is a restoring God. You know, when we, we're in the church, we teach we shouldn't do things, we shouldn't sin. That's to help us not get there. But if we get there, God's there to help us out because he loves us. Even in our failures, he loves us. And he does not change his love for us. 
And let me say this. Once he cleanses and once he forgives and once he restores, that is it. It's a done deal with God. Amen? Amen.